Breaking news. Canon has leaked two new upcoming cameras. The Fujifilm X-H2 specs have completely leaked. We have information about the new iPhone 14. And Google has shown off some amazing tech that just might kill the conventional camera finally. But first, a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. You need a web presence, something better than your social media, something that is personalized and can't be taken away by Mark Zuckerberg. You need to go to squarespace.com slash Tony. Set up a website today. Create a custom logo, a full domain, your entire brand for a photography project, a business, your video reel, whatever it is, the perfect place to start is squarespace.com slash Tony. That's what I use. Try it out for free. When you love it, use the coupon code Tony and you'll get 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. First, the exciting new iPhone 14. Yes, this is important photography news because every new smartphone release seems to be all about the camera. They've already killed off 97% of the conventional camera market and they are not stopping. This doesn't hurt my feelings. I don't think photography is about the shape of the camera. I think it is about the images you take. So for me, I personally am excited to see what Apple has coming on September 7th. Now they did give us one really big clue. The logo here is the Apple logo, but with stars. And astrophotography has been a focus of all the smartphone companies. Yes, that's where smartphone camera tech is. You can now take amazing astrophotography photos with any modern smartphone. In fact, the iPhone already does a fantastic job of that. You can do like eight second handheld exposures that show off stars way better than a conventional handheld camera possibly could. Or you can put it on a magnetic tripod, snaps right on and take 30 second exposures that really show the dim stars. But the fact is, Apple is behind the likes of the Google Pixel, which actually has more sophisticated astrophotography technology. The Google Pixel can track stars as they move through the sky and take four minute exposures with no star trails that show the dimmest of stars. It actually beats even full frame conventional cameras in a lot of scenarios. Seriously, it's astounding. So what will Apple show us on September 7th? Well, I think they will probably add that star tracking feature that Google already has, but it's kind of lame if they're just playing catch up. Would they lead with that? I've had on my charts for some time now an exciting feature that would revolutionize astrophotography. For years now, I've used augmented reality star apps to find constellations and planets to point my conventional camera at. They work amazing. You just hold your phone up and you can see the stars in front of you. Why not use that technology that can find and pinpoint exact stars to overlay images created by NASA? After all, we know exactly what those stars look like and where they're going to be. Why are we trying to recapture the exact same thing when we're never going to do better than the Hubble telescope, right? Use augmented reality and some imaging to align the stars, separate out things in the foreground like people, trees, clouds even, and then overlay those NASA images with a little slider so you can decide how much of the stars you want to show. And then even with a short snapshot, you would be able to show the stars as your eye saw them or perhaps even more vibrant. Apple has the tech to do it, but would this ruin astrophotography? Well, certainly it would devalue those of us who had been developing astrophotography skills for 20 something years, right? But the fact is bringing astrophotography to the masses, whether augmented or not, will help more people appreciate the bigger universe. It will get them out taking pictures of the stars and appreciating nature. And so while we are losing something, I think the overall benefit to humanity might be a positive. In other smartphone news, Google released a shocking video showing what their latest tech can do for smartphone images. This technology uses artificial intelligence to drastically improve the dynamic range of the images. It can pull up the noisy shadows. Even full frame cameras have noisy shadows when you recover them and completely eliminate that noise. 
but it can even identify objects and extrapolate, filling in details that were not clearly visible in the original image. Just like your human brain might be able to spot a bicycle in the background, it can spot that bicycle and draw in some of the details. The results are clear. It is capable of producing incredible images in challenging conditions. But this demonstration goes further than that. They also create incredible bokeh that would require a massive full-frame lens to do with a conventional camera, but they can do it in post-processing with software. And besides creating the bokeh, they can even shift the focal plane so you could use a still image and pull focus across it. Because the AI can actually identify individual objects and create distances for them, it essentially creates a 3D model that can then be shifted. So all of this can be done with a still image, and it is astounding. Now, I think the most likely outlet of this is the next Google Pixel. Well, maybe not the next Google Pixel, but a future Google Pixel. Now, question for you, is this the death of the traditional camera, a market that has already fallen by 97% thanks entirely to the popularity of the smartphone? Will it kill it, or will these manufacturers manage to find ways to catch up? Over and over again, people tell me, why don't traditional manufacturers use this computational photography so we could have all those benefits applied to original, higher quality images? Because garbage in, garbage out, right? If we capture images with big glass and a big sensor, surely even the augmented, computed images would be higher quality. That is true. But smartphone manufacturers are woefully behind on software, and they don't seem willing to go down the path of using a more advanced operating system like Android that would open up the application programming interfaces they would need in order to implement these features. In my opinion, camera manufacturers have a choice. Either they continue down the path that they've gone with proprietary operating systems and primitive software until their market share continues to drop and we're left with only very specialized people, probably like myself and maybe like you, using them. Or they could finally make the leap and implement a layer of Android OS on top of their existing software, allowing them to implement computational photography and do things like more complex file transfers. Now, not everybody wants that. But right now we have zero cameras that have that feature. So let's at least give us one camera that has that feature. I think the most likely company to do this is Sony because they currently make Android smartphones and they make cameras. But up until this point, they've been taking camera features and putting it in their smartphone, but not the other way around. So while those two groups are intermingling, I'd like to see the technology trickle in the other direction. Back to traditional cameras, let's talk about the upcoming Fujifilm X-H2. Not to be confused with the X-H2S, which is already launched, the X-H2 is coming later this year. And all this information comes from our friends at FujiRumors.com. Definitely go to their blog and subscribe, I do. Here are the specs that are rumored. It's going to have 40 megapixels, and for video, it's going to shoot 8K at 30 frames per second. So this is going to be the first APS-C camera that can do 8K. This is kind of the headline feature, and we were all very excited about it when the R5 was announced. But since then, other than a couple of test videos, I have not used 8K at all. It is a pain to edit. Nobody cares. This video, I shoot it in 1080. I have a 4K camera sitting right there, but I don't bother to set it up because, like, Nobody cares. Most of the big YouTube channels are just shooting in HD because people mostly watch videos on their phone, honestly, mostly held vertically. So you're only seeing like 320 pixels. Most people don't even bother turning it sideways. So do we need 8K? I don't think we do. I don't think it's going to push a lot of people to the platform, but every manufacturer kind of needs 8K bragging rights now. It'll have a more useful 4K 60, that's my favorite format to film in, or it'll do HD at 120 frames per second, which is four times slow motion. Now, those specs don't match the X-H2S, which is a more video-oriented camera doing HD at 240 frames per second. So, while it does have that cool 8K, most video people are going to get the X-H2S. This is more of a stills camera. Still, the video will have 13 stops of dynamic range, which is great for an APS-C camera, but doesn't match the 14 or more stops that the X-H2 has. Now, for still images, I mentioned it's a 40 megapixel sensor. Not clear if that's going to be the bare or the X-trans sensor, but personally, I'm hoping it's just going to be a standard bare sensor. It is going to have a feature similar to Sony's Pixel Shift. Sony, Pentax, Olympus, and several other companies have offered this. With this feature, the sensor will move either a full pixel or half a pixel, 
and allow you to gather full color information for every pixel, but also higher resolution. Now, real world, I never use pixel shift. I, well, I've tried hundreds of times, and every single time I've come up with artifacts. Even with completely still landscapes, a heavy tripod under perfect conditions, it still gets screwed up. Because the fact is, 160 megapixels is a whole lot, and the tiniest of movements of the Earth will completely ruin that image and create awful artifacts. So maybe Fuji has figured out how to reduce those artifacts, or maybe they just want to brag that they have 160 megapixels. I'm excited to try it out. Be sure to subscribe to see those tests. Fuji Rumors is saying that it's going to have a CF Express Type-B and an SD card, so those big files will be offloaded quicker and buffering will be less of a problem. The electronic shutter is going to have a max shutter speed of 1 180 thousandths of a second, which is a very small amount of time. And I have cameras with shutter speeds of like 1 32 thousandths of a second, but I don't think I've ever real world gone over 1 8 thousandths of a second. You would need a massive amount of light to expose something properly at 1 180 thousandths of a second. And even then, I suspect this camera is going to have some pretty serious rolling shutter issues. So it would have to be a mostly still subject, or you would be getting rolling shutter artifacts. And what still subject would you want to photograph at an outrageously high shutter speed? So the usefulness of this seems dubious, but again, subscribe and we'll test it out. This camera is supposed to be launched on September 8th, and Fuji Rumors is saying the price is going to be $2,000, which should be very competitive for an 8K camera. Now let's talk about the two new Canon cameras. The first one I'm calling the Canon R100, and this information comes from Canon Rumors, though we don't know much except that they are coming later this year. I think the Canon R100 is going to be a lower end Canon R10 because the Canon R10, great camera, we just finished reviewing it, but it's priced at $1,000. And that's currently the entry level RF camera. But a thousand bucks is not entry level, that's a mid range price. Canon needs to get that price down to $500, which is what most people want to spend. I think it's going to be priced more like $800, and Canon's really going to strip down the R10 to hit that price point. I think they're going to take away our electronic viewfinder. I think it's not going to have IBIS, same as the R10, and I think they're going to lower the frames per second from 15 with the mechanical shutter down to 10, and 23 with the electronic shutter down to 15. So it'll still be usable for sports, but it won't be quite the fantastic sports and wildlife machine that the R10 is. I think it'll have that same 24 megapixel sensor, and just like the R10, it'll shoot 4K 30 full width or 4K at 60 frames per second with a heavy crop and full HD at four times slow motion, 120 frames per second. And this is my own guess, nobody's rumoring this, but I think at the same time, Canon will launch a wide angle APS-C RF lens because that is a massive hole in the lineup. You literally cannot shoot wide angle with a native lens on the R10 or R7 at the moment. So I think it's going to be an RFS 10 to 18 probably just taking one of their uh, M mount lenses and converting the amount to RF. Now the camera I'm more excited about is the Canon R8. This is a replacement for the aging full frame mirrorless camera, the Canon EOS R, which was Canon's first R mount camera. And when that launched, I did not love it. Frankly, it was not ready. They were not finished with the software, but over the years, Canon released several firmware updates that made it a very usable and good camera that to this day we recommend. Still, it's $1,800 and it was launched at the end of 2018, I recall, so it's very old and definitely due for a replacement. Now, CanonRumors.com has said that a replacement is coming but hasn't said much else, except that the name is not going to be the Canon EOS R Mark II. Now, let me rant about Canon's naming scheme for a second. <laughs> their first R mount camera was simply called the R with no numbers. And then their second camera was a lower end camera called the RP. With the RP, Canon established a naming scheme for the R mount that starts with an R and then adds a letter for each different model number. But wait, the next cameras were the Canon R6, R5, and R3. That had the letter R and then a number. And as the number got lower, the cameras got more expensive. So, okay, that makes some sense. I guess Canon changed their mind about the naming scheme after the RP. So the cheapest of those three cameras, the R6, $2,500. The R is positioned at $1,800. So it's less expensive. So you would think it was going to be called the R7, right? Except the R7 already exists. It's an APS-C camera priced at $1,500. 
So I don't, they're not gonna call it the R6.5. Maybe they're gonna call it the R8. That's my best guess. But Canon's naming scheme is enough to really give me a headache. Here's what I think the Canon R8 specs are going to be. I think the price point is going to be about $2,000 because all prices are going up. I think it'll have the same resolution, about a 30 megapixel sensor, but it'll probably be a new sensor with a faster readout speed to allow for better autofocus, which is going to be the key selling point for this. I'm not sure if it's going to have IBIS. They might separate it from the $2,500 R6 by taking away that feature. They'll have to find a few things to take away. One thing that will definitely be lower than the R6 is the frames per second. Whereas the R6 does 12 frames per second mechanical and 20 with the electronic shutter, pretty minimal rolling shutter, I think this is going to be more about 8 with the mechanical and 12 with the electronic shutter. So it'll still be usable for sports and wildlife, it just won't be as powerful as the R6, which is going to be Canon's goal. Now, will it have one SD card or two? Typically at a $2,000 price point you would have two memory cards. But again, I think they need to separate it from the R6, and so I'm guessing they're only going to give it one SD card, but I certainly hope it has two. No doubt Canon will lose the touch bar that was on the original R. Every reviewer hated that design, and Canon never reused it, so we will never see that again. I suspect it will have the joystick from the Canon R7. For video, I think it'll be 4K 30 full width or 4K 60 cropped, both with good video autofocus. The EOS R original would shoot 4K with a crop, but it didn't really have good video autofocus in that mode, so that would be a big upgrade. Or it'll do four times slow-mo in HD. I also think it will have a top screen to it, because one of the nice things about the R was, while the features were basic, it felt great. It had a good quality electronic viewfinder, a good rear screen, and that top screen, I always thought of it as a luxury version of the entry-level Canon R Peep. In the comments down below, tell me what you would like to see from the next Canon cameras. Tell me what you want to see from your next iPhone camera or your next Google Pixel camera. And check out squarespace.com slash Tony, the best place to start a web presence, the best place to start a business, a portfolio, or a personal project. Create your own domain separate from all the social media that you completely control. No ads. You own it. I've had domains for more than 20 years. Think of Squarespace as your forever website. So go to squarespace.com slash Tony to get started. Try it out completely free, no credit card. And when you love it, use the coupon code Tony and you can get 10% off. Thanks for sponsoring us Squarespace. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. Bye.